Hey, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever it is that you are in the world or even watching us on replay. Thanks for joining today. My name is Karen from GeoNadia and really looking forward to getting into today's lunch and learn or breakfast and learn, whatever it might be for you. I'm today joining from the unceded lands of the Irrigandji people and not quite getting too wet at the moment, but we are bracing for tropical cyclone Jasper to hit. So I thought it was really apt that I give a little bit of a session on how we use drone mapping in disaster management. I'm going to whip through a couple of slides, do a quick presentation, and then we'll take questions as well. Also online, I've got Joan with me. She's based in, in Townsville, so really on the outskirts of Jasper today. All right, so just as a bit of context to why I decided to do this talk today right now. So this on the right-hand side of the screen is the radar and you can see at the moment, so I'm just north of Cairns here in, in far north Queensland, Australia. And this is tropical cyclone Jasper just sitting off the coast to the east. And it's due to make landfall at some stage in the early hours of tomorrow morning. And right now it looks like the eye is going to hit just north of Port Douglas. Yesterday was sitting pretty much over the top of my house. So it looks like it has moved a little bit further north, which is good for us, but still planning to get quite a drenching and wear out sandbagging and all that sort of stuff at the moment in readiness, but also then looking at what does it mean to be ready in terms of data and hence today's talk. All right, so what I wanted to touch on firstly is how remote sensing and by re remote sensing, I'm meaning drone data, but also satellite data, how that fits into the disaster management as a whole. So the disaster management cycle has four stages. So we have reduction, readiness, response, and recovery. And I guess response is kind of the sexy phase of the disaster management cycle. That's where we get a lot of news around that. And that's really what happens when, when we have our first responders going in to help out and provide aid. But actually, it is a full cycle. And it's really important to consider how remote sensing can contribute to that as well. So firstly, in the reduction Stage. So this is where we're trying to reduce the impact of any impending disaster or hazard. And it's not necessarily that anything is, is in the here and now, but it's something in the future. And we use remote sensing and drone mapping at this stage to really start looking at baseline data and how we can feed that into our models that helps out with city planning, for example. How we put into, in, into play any interventions that can reduce community or asset risk at that point as well. When we hit readiness, and that's where we are in far north Queensland at the moment, that is when a warning for something has been issued and there is an imminent chance that some form of disaster is likely to hit. And that's really what I wanted to focus today's talk about. So we'll come back to some of the activities that I've been doing in preparation for that as well. Response is can be a phase that lasts a while or it could be really short. This is really where we look at getting spatial data and using it to provide intelligence into helping people know how to prioritise aid. And recovery can take days to years, really looking at how we track the rates of change in the future. And to just go through that cycle, what I wanted to show is an example from a paper that I wrote a few years ago now that was based on tracking the the four stages of the disaster management cycle through Hurricane Katrina. And I'll get Joan to pop the link to this paper in the chat for you if you like. It's open access so you can read the details. It's obviously a little bit outdated in terms of the technology that's available, but in terms of the disaster management cycle, the, the concept of it is, is pretty much the same. So what you can see tracking from the upper left is pre-disaster, so really thinking about if you like the readiness phase or even prior to readiness. Then we've got during the disaster itself, so what's the impact of the immediate disaster, and then we're tracking the recovery afterwards as well and providing some form of information product after that. You can see the range of data sets. This is satellite data, and, and I've actually just used those data sets from, from Google Earth at the time as well, based on what was captured. Now, the interesting thing is that now we have 
drone data that's available to actually give us a lot more information about that. So what I wanted to do is just have a look at how things have changed since I wrote that paper in 2010 and where drone data now gives us more information and, and a range of different information as well. So really some of the values of having drone data to start with is that we're not at the whim of satellite data providers. That means that it doesn't matter if a satellite is in its orbit or overpass it doesn't matter if the satellite company decides to turn the sensor on or not, we can go out and we can capture the data when and where we want it. It's also important because when we think about satellite overpasses, for example, if satellite came over today, it's completely cloudy outside, whereas I've got a break in rain and I could actually get out right now and fly if I need it. But satellite data right now is going to be absolutely useless. The other part of that is that in the case that I'm going to show a little bit later is that I'm, I'm really interested in coastal erosion as one of the impacts of the cyclone. And to be able to capture data for that, I need to do it at low tide. And that doesn't necessarily align with when the satellite's overpassing. As you can see on the right-hand side, we get so much more detail from our drone data. So up the top is the drone data at two centimeters ground sample distance. And down the bottom is a simulated satellite data at a three meter resolution. So it's the exact same data set, but I've just resampled it to show you what the exact same data would look like. And it's interesting when you look at this. So along this area here where my cursor is, is an area of fairly significant erosion, actually quite close to this path and quite close to the road that goes through this local beach suburb. And those features are completely missed when we look at the satellite data at three meters resolution, which is the type of data that may become available quite soon as well. Also, we have the ability with drone data to create three dimensional models, which is super important for this type of thing. If I'm interested in looking at erosion, I'm interested in looking at slope and erosion and deposition and how we see things cut away as well. So super important and super cool things that we can get out of the drone data. So just a point, when drones are not so good. And the very first thing is to obviously be really careful because you actually can't fly drones in disaster situations unless you've got permits to do so. So it's really important to know when other aerial services are operating. So that's not a good thing in those cases. Um, when there's heavy rain, not so good for drones. When it's too windy, uh, one of the drones I have has a, has a rating up to 40 knots, so 80 k's an hour. Which is, which is pretty good. So in most cases, I'm still going to be able to get there, out there if I need it. But I can also not cover really, really large areas. So it's good for my, some of my local beaches, but in small segments at a time. So trade-offs all the time. What I wanted to do now is to jump into a quick case study. And so this, this particular footbridge that you see here just recently be constructed at one of my local beaches. And in fact, you can actually see the, the shadow of the scaffolding. It's around the, it's kind of a handrail. Also, the bridge or pathway itself is still closed. Here's the, here's the gateway to it. So it has been opened and people have gone through. And I'm really curious to know if we are still going to have this bridge in a couple of days' time. It's officially due to open at the end of this week or early next week as well. And so I really hope it's still there. It's a great bridge connecting some of our local coastal communities. So it was one of the areas that I wanted to target in, um, in a drone data capture. So what I'm going to jump into now is to demonstrate how I go about making a mission plan to be able to capture data in that area. Joan, can you just give me the thumbs up that you can see the hotel mission planning up on the screen there? Sweet. Thank you. All right, so I am just planning on my phone here. I'm just connecting up to my screen to give you a bit of a feel of what I would do when I'm out in the field. So I'm going to go in and this is um, the Autel mission planning app that's connected to an Autel drone, but there's many other planning apps you can use depending on the drone that you have. I'm going to go ahead and go into mission planning. And you can see ones that I've actually flown, but I'll go in and create a new one so you can see how easy it is to be able to do this. I'm going to create a polygon mission. So that's going to uh, allow me to go into, into a site and to create a plan over that area. So I'm going to zoom all the way in to the area where I'm interested in planning. And that's around about this area just here that you see on the screen now. And so now if I just click the plus on my phone screen or tablet, whatever I've got, that immediately drops a mission plan there. So the idea of this is that the drone is going to autonomously fly this mission and it's going to do it in a really 
regular and a repeatable way as well. So I can save this mission. I can go ahead and fly it again after the cyclone. So I can move this about and I can expand the area that I'm interested in. And as I do this, you'll see that it dynamically changes where the flight lines go. So the flight lines are the blue ones flying backwards and forwards like a, like a lawnmower in the sky. And as it does that, I also want you to take note of these numbers up the top here. So this one says it's going to take four minutes and 15 seconds, cover an area of 16,000 meters squared and take 98 photos. So I know in this particular drone, I'm pretty happy with flying for 15 minutes. So I might make my area a little bit larger. I could make it quite significant, large, significantly larger if I like to fly all the way up to 15 minutes. I can also change some of the parameters down here. So as I tap into that, you'll see it has a default altitude of 60 meters. So if I fly it higher, I can cover larger areas. So I can go ahead and change that up to a maximum of 120 meters in terms of Australian law. I can fly up to 120 meters above ground. You'll see as I do that, the level of detail or the GSD has changed as well. So if you watch this number here and watch the number at the top, you'll see all of those dynamically changing as I change my altitude. And Joe will pop in the chat a link to a blog that helps you understand what the optimal altitude is when you're flying to capture the various features that you might be interested in as well. So I can also go across and change a number of other parameters as well, like the overlap and side lap. I typically keep 80% overlap, 80% side lap. That generally gives me a really good result when I process the data. And then I can also change the direction that the drone is going to fly as well here. That's the course angle. So I can set that to be automatic, or if I have a particular reason that I want the drone to be flying at a certain angle, then I can do that as well. So let's say that we're really happy with that particular mission. I want to take care that I've got at least three flight lines that's going to allow me to process it properly. Then when I'm out in the field, all I need to do is to connect up my drone, and then I would press this button, and drone's going to go, go along and take photos as it goes. So what I'd like to do now is to jump over and show you a, here's one I created early, earlier, and you'll be able to see what the outcome of that particular mission was. So that mission we'll actually see all the way in, this is our completed mission. And if I have a look at the photos themselves, that's what you'll see here. So I come back to, to my office and download all the photos from my SD card, which is several hundred photos in this case, are all overlapping each other. So you'll see each one looks very similar to the previous one. And that will allow the software to be able to process the data sets together. So if I go into the details of that data set, you'll see again all those photos down there. You'll see the, the altitude. Um, usually the altitude pops up. This one it's, doesn't like this particular drone, so it's not giving me my altitude. But I'll see other details that are automatically extracted from that data set and any other, any other information that I add in there for myself. So any particular description, any additional information about the mission plan itself. And if I wanted to put that directly into a GIS, if I'm working in ArcGIS or QGIS, I'll be able to copy this link and put it in through the tile server there as well. So you'll see it's stitched together all the photos. And also I can have a look at the digital surface model, which gives me information about the, the lumps and bumps of the land, including the trees and buildings and bridges, and also the digital terrain model, which attempts to remove some of the trees and some of the buildings as well and give us an idea of what, looks, what it looks like underneath that. Now, if I've flown this mission and that's something that I want to then get some more information about and maybe I want to share this with other people, I'm going to add it to a project. And in this case, I want to create a new project and maybe I will call this webinar just for the sake of it. I'm going to add that into my new project and jump across here to now where I'm going to start looking at perhaps mapping over this particular area. Now I can also share this with you. So if you, if you are a collaborator or a stakeholder, 
and also interested in the work that we're doing. I'm going to copy that and I'm actually going to pop it in the chat for you. And if you do want to jump in, you're able to do that as well. So the sorts of things that I might be interested in if I'm looking at this particular data set is I may want to mark some critical infrastructure, for example. So I might just copy in a point here and say, well, this is my bridge that I'm interested in. So I pop in that this might be I've got infrastructure and that point might be the bridge. And then I can just continue going along and adding different points of interest as well. And so I, I can also see Sophie's in there as well. I can see her cursor there. I can see Joan, um, some anonymous people who haven't logged into the system and anyone that's popping in up the top, I can see them there as well. So I can see what other people are looking at. And they can go through and not edit anything at this point. So I've only given a view and comment access. But anyone that is actually logged in, they'll be able to comment. So if they say, oh, actually, you know, here's, here's a house that was damaged or is of interest, they might go in and add a comment like that as well. So, Joan, I might just get you to um, leave a comment, though, so we can see that one pop up. And then we can go ahead and, and have a look at that interaction as that appears. I can also add my own comments as well. If I might say, this is a... Yeah parking lot to take care of, for example. And I've seen Jones popped up a comment there as well. So I can I can see that particular point. Um, and if I think that's interesting, I might reply to that as well. So I might say, I should pop that in there. And I go, yes, definitely. So you can see this is a really good way that you're able to start to engage with stakeholders and even the community as well. So you could actually put something like this out more broadly and say, right, if you've got issues in your area, please jump in and, and let us know where you have any other challenges that we might need to consider. Now, what you'll also see in here is that I've added one data set in, but it's also told me that there's another two data sets that are available that are a part of our global repository. So you might want to think about adding other data sets as well. And so what I'm going to show you again is, is one I've created earlier, is, our, is a range of data sets across my local beaches. And this is part of my own data readiness where I've brought it all together so that I can start to look at, I've got Clifton, Kawara and Trinity Park here as well. This is the closest beach to me, but there's always too many people in that area for me, me to be able to fly because I'm not allowed to fly over the top of people. So I miss this area, which, which unfortunately is one of the large areas of risk as well. But so this is how I start to bring together my data sets as part of my readiness. And then the, my intent is that after the site point passes, we'll go out and run those exact same missions again and be able to look at any change over time. Most of those areas I have been mapping for the past three years as well. So we have a time series already available to us to check out, okay, so what did it look like three years ago and what is it looking like now as well? So I might just pause there and see a couple of things popping up in the chat. So Joan, did you wanna just let me know what some of those questions are, please? Yep, sure. I've uh, got a couple of questions from Frank. Uh, so the question here is a bit related to the prediction of the cyclone. Uh, there's first question is how long time warning we can predict a cyclone. Yeah, I, I can't answer that one. I'm just I just follow information that's available to me in a, in a range of different places. So for example, this website that I have up here is our Cairns dashboard. And I'm just following what the, the track is that everybody else has access to as well. I also use another other apps that help me understand where if it's going to be safe for me to fly as well. Uh, really, weather is what is an, is an Australian one, I understand, but I'm, I'm sure there's other versions of it overseas as well. And I use that to check out what the what the wind is going to be like and if it's going to be within the, the range of what my drone is capable of doing and also the rain as well. So although actually at the moment it says that it's particularly windy, but we haven't hit that yet, but I was relying heavily on this 
as I was flying over the past couple of days as well. But in terms of being a meteorologist and predicting that, that sort of stuff long term, I'm not the person. I'm not sure if there's anyone online that is able to jump in on that one. But aside from that, I just follow what the Bureau of Meteorology um, says as well as the Cairns Council. Yep, so I I think I agree. I really have no clue how the weather is going to change since I'm not a meteorologist. Uh, Frank's question is a bit similar. The rest of it, including how fast the weather condition could escalate, how much time we've got before the full impact hit us, or the weather condition will impair the drone flying. So I think this will be all related to what you've talked just now. Uh, one interesting question is that can we in predict the cyclone direction? Uh, which I, to, for my past personal experience, is kind of hard. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think there, there's obviously some prediction that's going on in terms of um, watching what this track was over the past few days. And it has, it is predicted to come up here and then there's a change in direction there. I don't know how that is done. I assume it's it's done by understanding the the weather systems that surround the cyclone itself as well. But yeah, again, outside my expertise. Yeah, and one last question from Frank that could be interesting is um, in terms of gathering pre-event data to help assess the damage post cyclone. Um, from your past experience, is there any like target or deliverable you'd like to achieve when you're capturing the mission or planning the mission? Yeah, well, so for me, like in the, in this case here, what I'm what I'm doing here is is gathering in a bunch of data sets that already exist in this particular area, and we can see that there's a total of nineteen data sets. I've only grabbed a couple in in this particular project. Um, if I zoom out further and I start thinking, actually, it actually looks like the main crossing point is now going to be north of Port Douglas. And so I might, might need to decide, okay, actually, I need to get data sets that already exist elsewhere. In this area, I can see that there's one data set available. And I might even just choose to go directly back to the global map and see what is around in the area as well. And that's, but that's if I'm just looking at drone data as well, right? So there's plenty of other different sources of, of mapping information that's not just related to drone data. And if I was in the Cooktown region, there's a range of data sets that could be of use there as well. Or, of course, head out and capture your own in the way that I've been doing over the past couple of days. One thing I will say is that I wasn't as, as prepared or as ready as I could have been. The tides have not been fabulous over the past few days. And it means that the day that I the data that I've captured are not as ideal as I would like them to be. So I should have gone out two weeks ago and captured data two weeks ago. I would have had much lower tides and they would have coincided with better sun angle for what I was working on as well. But it sort of got to the point of late last week, I thought, oh, actually better go out and get the most recent data that I can get, which yeah, should have been about two weeks ago. And we also have a question from Kirsty. Uh, so she's interested in uh, to understand how quickly the data can be pulled together post data collection uh, or after the cyclone and what level of damages can be seen. Yeah, it's a really good question. So if you look at, um, if we look at these areas, for example, uh, that I was showing, in, in my project, and I'll share this in this project as well, because um, I will continue to populate this particular project with um, with any additional data that I capture. So let me just pop this link in the chat for you as well. So in terms of being able to curate some of those data sets, so this particular data set here that you see on the screen now, I flew yesterday um at uh, around about lunchtime yesterday i uploaded it into the system and then it was available i would say within an hour and a half to two hours depending on the, the size of the data set so the biggest challenge is 
first of all, making sure that you've got power to be able to upload power and, and Wi-Fi, and then obviously maintaining that power to be able to continue to analyze the data that are there. And if, if you are working within a community of people, so for example, I've got some colleagues down in the council area who are doing a similar thing as well. It's really, really easy to curate as long as everybody's putting it in the same place, which is what we're encouraging people to do as well. So it is actually free to upload your data to GeoNidea and all those data then, if you choose for them to be made publicly available, it's really easy for others to then access and start to use it as well. So time really isn't that big of a deal. In terms of assessing damages, so you see these data sets are captured sort of around about the two centimeter um, uh, GSD, a ground sample distance. So if you were to have a look at this area here, so this is not like cyclone damage. This is, this is an area where there used to be actually quite dense in mangroves and those mangroves have died. But if you go all the way in, you can see individual branches and even leaves and trees and that sort of thing. So if you're thinking about the level of damage that you might, might see on a building, as long as it's bigger than say 20 centimeters or so, then you're going to be able to see it in this type of imagery. I think we've all caught up with some questions so far. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions that they that they'd like to either pop in the chat or feel free to um, to yell out as well? I've probably got questions more. Yeah, sure. jump um, in. Let us know. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you're going to be using, like, in terms of correlating the two data sets. So, so you've got your base uh, data from two two weeks ago, and now you're overlaying the brand new post Oakland data. Um, do you use like AI to just hi quickly highlight the changes? Is it like can you see red areas where there's yeah, been so like a lot yeah, of damage? So a really good question. So we've been working on another project where we're looking at buildings' footprints and how they change as well. So that's that isn't that's an option. I think we there are challenges, I, I guess, in any of these types of data sets. One of the first things is that if you haven't flown your drone with additional ground control, they never ever sit exactly on top of each other. So you can see actually I'll pop in another data set um into this here um so I've actually I've got a range of data sets in this particular location so I will put in let's grab in another data set in that location to, so you'll be able to see what I mean by this offset So what you'll see sitting on the top of that data set now is the same as a smaller area from October 2020, so three years ago. Um, now, if I zoom into that, so you'll actually see this was a lot closer to the time when these mangroves died, so you can actually see a lot more structure in the mangroves themselves. Um, you'll see towards the edges of where the houses and swimming pools are, and no, I don't fly directly over the top of the houses and swimming pools, but as I, as I change between the two data sets, so from October 2020 and yesterday, um, I can change the transparency of the two. So you'll actually see that there are some variation, not only just in the area that I flew, um, but a variation in exactly where different features are. So using automated means of detecting change is actually quite difficult. So to be able to do that, you need to do two things. You need to first of all identify the, identify the type of thing that has changed 
and then identify that it has changed. And that's it's something that we're doing quite a lot of work on in, in our research and development, but I would say that it's not a it's not an automated AI tool at the moment. Joan, I don't know if you want to jump in there and add anything about your AI experience there as well. Yeah, I think I agree. Like right now, um, I think there are some sort of AI tools to try to match. Like you said, like each two different layers are not 100% overlapping if the if the maps are collected without the ground control points or other references to make them match with each other. Uh, I believe there are someone trying to uh, matching them before doing any change detection. Uh, but again, since change detection, everyone is looking at very different things. Uh, it's really hard to have one model to detect all the changes. Like someone wants to look at whether there's any vegetation damage. Someone might want to look at whether the coastal, the shoreline, whether there's any changes. Uh, I think in each specific applications, there might be specific researchers about it at very specific location, but I'm not aware that anything on the market uh, that is able to do very smart change detection, there will be general raster or elevation model change detection that are available in GIS softwares. But I think as far as I know, that's the, yeah, that's the limit that we've got so far. So, yeah, okay, cool. So just 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 because I missed the beginning, sorry, and I'm sure you've probably already explained this, but this is a university project at the moment, is it? Or is it more of a commercial build? Oh, this is, yeah, this is a product that's that's available on the market, Kirsty. Okay, um, yeah. So um, I'll just get Jane actually put the link in to Gianna Deer in the chat yeah. there. Um, so I... I, I am an academic at James Cook University and I do a lot of research into drone mapping. However, the platform that I've just been demonstrating is a commercial product. It's, and it's something that I've de developed out of my research as well, but it's, yeah, it's commercially available and has de uh, definite commercial intent. Yeah. Okay, cool, Leo. Yeah. Because uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from. So I work for a company called Stomatic. We're a disaster recovery company. We're obviously already preparing for any um inundate flood inundation in property and so forth so that's why i'm here sort of trying to work out if if there was any use yeah, case for us from that, that point of view yeah so i think yeah, um, yeah. absolutely happy to follow up offline with you as okay. well, let's do that then no one else has to listen to me yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure people are so interested in the general questions as well but yeah let's um let's follow up online um, if you just if you want to maybe uh, send Joan a DM with your email, um, we can get in touch that way. Um, all right. Any any other questions that we can help out with? I'm also I'm conscious of time. We do try to keep these to half an hour, and I know everybody's really busy, and particularly if you're in the far north Queensland area, you may be out sandbagging, sandbagging as well. But I'm really happy to stay online and continue to have a have a chat with anybody that would like to do so as well. Or if you've got any other questions, please let us know. And we've got two more questions in the chat. Uh, one uh, is a quick question for you. When will you likely to be back here with the follow-up of the data you've captured? Yeah, so that's that's actually a really good question. It depends on the weather. So I am due to fly out to New Zealand on Friday morning. So if, if the weather is good, then hopefully I'll get Thursday flights in. If the weather is not so good, but I still get out to New Zealand, then it may rest on Joan's shoulders when she's up this way in the next couple of weeks. Otherwise, we'll be done early January. So it all, as everything with this, it all depends, but we will get post imagery done as, as quickly as possible. If indeed we get hit. And we also have another question about the ground control points. Uh, I think Alvin was asking, how do you do the AGC, which I believe is the aerial ground control points? Uh, and do you need a separate ground module for that? Hmm. I actually haven't heard the term aerial ground, ground control points. Can you answer that one, Joan, or maybe Owen, do you I, Yeah, I might be wrong with the abbreviation. Um, if I'm guessing the uh, abbreviation correctly, 
if Owen's uh, Owen's still there. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, I, I, I thought you called it, uh, um, AGC or aerial ground control or something before. Um, but I was wondering how you do the ground control. Do you put um, visual markers or do you need something electronic? Is yeah, how is that done? So yeah, so sorry, I would have used the acronym GCP for ground control point. Um, sorry if you think of names. Yeah, that's my mistake. Typically, typically what we do is is to put out markers and use use a high-end GPS to go around and get the ground control that way and make sure that the, the markers are visible in the drone data and then we can get the measurements on the ground as well and then we correct the two together. If in some case, on some occasions, you can't get out and put out ground control points. You can use features that are already available in, in the environment. We call them natural ground control points. So, for example, in this particular scene, I don't have any ground control points out, but I could quite easily go to, say, fence corners or something like that and go and get the, the location for that and then post-correct my data as well. Um, alternatively, there are, there are some drones that are called RTK drones, so real-time kinematic. They have, I guess, if you like, more accurate GPS available on board to them, and they will get closer to the, the real location. But at the moment, the drones that I've demonstrated here have got a plus or minus five meters in the X, Y horizontal dimension. Anything else that Joan or I can help with while we're here online? We also have uh, another question from the chat. Um, Frank is asking, are these pre-event data help that help assess the damage post-cyclone can be used to mitigate the cyclone damage and protect more area? Yeah, absolutely. Again, that's another really good question. So if you go back to what I was uh, what I was talking about in our in my little demonstration at the beginning here, the disaster management cycle is a cycle. So when we're looking at being being able to capture the data and see the, the post post event, what, need, what happens in the response and even in the recovery that should be getting fed back into the reduction phase as well. So absolutely all of this should continue to, to inform the cycle and make sure that any impacts that we experience this time that we're minimizing the impact if a similar event was to hit in the subsequent year. All right, well, we might wrap it up there, but of course, feel free to reach out to us either through socials or in our email. We will also send out the recording probably later today, or if not early tomorrow, depending on if we have still have power or not, we'll get it to you as quickly as we can. And by all means, if you've got any questions, shoot us an email, reach out in any way, and, and we'll get back to you as, as quickly as we can. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, let us know. If there are other topics that you would like us to cover in the future as well in these sessions, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks everyone for taking some time out of your day. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon, evening, later today. See ya. <laughs>